once being told that we were all the same. And although this sounded good, I knew this wasn't true. It almost seemed as a way of making all of us who looked different from everyone else in the room feel as though they were a part of the majority. Later on, I learned that this majority is not indeed a majority at all, but a minority of immigrants claiming a land that is not theirs. Not only did I find this confusing, I found it underhanded and fraudulent. Why would these people characterize themselves as the rightful owners of America, knowing good and damn well they invaded from Europe? The audacity of the vulture who depicts himself as an eagle. There was this air of superiority and I thought to myself, they feel superior because they were the carriers of infectious disease. The more I studied, the more I realized that one of the most egregious misconceptions in world history is the idea that Asians depicted as mongoloids and Europeans depicted as Caucasians are a completely different race of people. But in fact, they are closely related, which fits scientifically into any scenario of geographic selection. Theorizing that populations so closely related by geographic proximity would inevitably share common genetics with those in the same area or region in which it inhabited while differing significantly from more distant populations. Geographic isolation has played a major role in the development of the modern human. According to the classical narrative of history, no humans existed in the Americas until the migration of the Mongols from Asia via the Bering Strait, therefore setting the foundation that even before the invasion of the Europeans in 1492, the Americas had already been claimed by Caucasians. The stock of the traditional Asian phenotype is often classified as mongoloid, completely separate from what we know as the Caucasian. But genetically, they are the same. The Caucasian actually covers the majority of Europe and Asia, but many people would be surprised to know that Caucasians populate the majority of North Africa above the Sahara. So even within Africa, the massive Sahara Desert separates the bloodlines between the Caucasian and the Negro. North of the Sahara, the representative population has high levels of Neanderthal DNA while the populations south of the desert have little to no Neanderthal DNA. But if the same people on the same continent are two totally different races of people, what are the differences that distinguish the two? The differences between the people of the Northern Horn in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa 
are more than just skin deep. Contrary to what most people think, skin color is not a determining factor in classifying the differences between the Caucasian and the Negro. Other factors such as hair texture, chin protrusion, and lip size are more critical factors in determining the difference between races. Dark-skinned Caucasians make up a large percentage of the population of South Asia. India, having over 1 billion people, provides a population that more than triples that of the United States. These people are the blood relatives of the North Africans, the Aryans, the Iranians, the Central Asians, and of course, the Europeans. So far we've covered Africa and Eurasia and we can clearly see two distinct lineages spring forth that are genetically different. But we still have yet to cover an entire third of the world. If we are to believe the historical narrative about America, no one was there and no civilization existed. But anyone who has studied world history for themselves knows that is a complete lie. brought about the genetic differences between that of the Caucasian and that of the Negro. The obvious differences included eye color, hair texture, and skin tone. Although darker races are found amongst several varieties of Caucasians, a certain degree of melanin is dominant across the Negro races of sub-Saharan Africa, as well as other genetically dominant features such as dark brown eye color, broad noses, and lips. The genetic traits that first indicate the differences between the people of Africa is hair texture. The Caucasian people of Northern Africa with straight, non-curly hair represent the same bloodlines that migrated out of the Caucasus region. The variations between the different people of North Africa indicate a history of admixture with the sub-Saharan Negro population as many of the Ethiopian stock possess features of both Caucasians and Negroes. Geographically, Caucasian features become more predominant the further north you travel, and Negro features predominate the further south.
that still leaves the question. How did Caucasians become genetically so different from Negroes? And how does the out of Africa theory or the theory of evolution account for this difference? If Negro features are genetically dominant traits, what factors could occur within nature for a pale skinned race to evolve? How was it possible for two similar beings to be genetically so different? According to the world's top geneticist, the process of cultivating or the initiation of another species from a completely different species requires a process called selection. Artificial selection is what breeders use to create new hybrid species of whatever they want to successfully reproduce. Long before the emergence of Darwinian evolutionary theory and the theory of natural selection, artificial selection had been used by plant and animal breeders to create desirable traits through breeding. Breeders would only breed certain animals or plants that produced rare features, crossbreeding them with others with similarly rare characteristics. This is how several different vegetables can be produced from the genetic splicing of a single mustard seed. The mustard plant can produce cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, kale, and kohlrabi. This example of hybridization can effectively create five different vegetables from one seed through a process called artificial selection or selective breeding. Animals are often inbred initially which lead to deleterious and recessive traits while also lacking the ability to reproduce. However, when this process of inbreeding occurs over generations and those populations are segregated from each other, the ability to reproduce is strengthened through a process called outbreeding depression. This is basically the idea that distant cousins have a far better chance of producing viable offspring than parents, brothers, and sisters who breed amongst each other. This same theory also applies to humans. These techniques of genetic manipulation are not new to the world of animals in general. Many new species have been created from a single ancestor. For example, the gray wolf is the common ancestor for every dog breed on earth and the genetic variation in every dog species could not have been accomplished without the hand of human intervention. How did dogs become man's best friend? First through domestication, then through genetically manipulated speciation. Wolves ran in packs and often would go days or even weeks without eating or feeding their young. 
In the cold northern climates of the Caucasus, all the way to the caves of the Rhineland Valley, wolves would begin to value the scraps of food left behind by these first men. Then inevitably, a bond began to grow between man and beast in Europe, to the point that today, animal brothels exist in several areas where men and women pay to have sex with animals with dogs being the most popular for both men and women followed by sedated donkeys and horses which horses and donkeys themselves can actually reproduce offspring although they are two different species the mule they produce however is not fertile according to a BBC news article from October 2002 there had only been 60 documented cases of mules reproducing foals since 1527 Comparably, a lion and tiger are two different species, but they also can produce offspring. A liger, however, just like the mule, the liger is also sterile. But dogs, horses, and cats aren't the only species to be created by man. In 1700, the average weight of a bull sold at slaughter was 370 pounds. But by 1786, the average bull had dramatically increased in size to the tune of 840 pounds, more than doubling in size in a span less than 90 years. Culturalist Robert Bakewell is credited with this innovation. He crossbred longhorned heifers and a Westmoreland bull to create the Dishley Longhorn. Bakewell was also successful crossbreeding sheep by selecting for hornless sheep with meaty bodies that also produced large amounts of wool. The evidence of this genetic hybridization of animals is well documented throughout history literally back until biblical times but is there any evidence of these techniques being used to create a human like species contrary to all migration theories put forth the variable between the genetics of mongoloid and caucasian phenotypes is far less than that between negroes and mongoloid populations if the beringia theory is correct then presumably the entire population of pre-columbian america would be of a mongoloid ethnicity but we know for an absolute fact that a thriving negro population flourished in north and south america with some of the most complex and populated societies ever known to man. If indeed such a population of dynamic proportions existed, why doesn't that survive within the narrative of classical history? Knowing the true accounts of pre-Columbian America will bring clarity to the understanding of why a certain people would want the entire world to believe that they were descended from apes. The process of being created through genetic manipulation has its ethical ramifications and therefore spiritual consequences. This need to deceive the world is a defense mechanism designed to deflect at all costs the true essence of their creation.
the absolute differences between the lineages of men is that those from the original bloodlines of the ancient populations were created and specifically designed by a primordial force that could create life without the need for earthly principles of reproduction while other populations were not created under the laws of the primordial force but by the containment of human limitation what develops is a humanoid species who resembles the image of a man but embodies the nature of the beast but how did this species come about and how is it even possible for this species to grow separately while maintaining several genetically recessive mutations without any influence from the original Negro populations of Europe, Asia, and Africa. These recessive populations were not the first to inhabit Asia, Europe, or Northern Africa. There is clear paleoanthropological evidence that Negroes populated the continents of Eurasia and the Americas long before the subsequent mongoloid slash caucasian migrations Top geneticists agree that the fairest races of white people most likely descended from Negroes. How did those Negroes become Caucasian? The procedure of manufacturing a Caucasian from a Negro requires an evolutionary technique that is very unlikely to have happened within a natural environment. Scientifically speaking, the progression, or more accurately, regression from Negro to Caucasian demands the forcible applied seclusion of one genetic group from the other, rather than the natural course of selection, meaning this group of people were most likely bred artificially within an isolated environment going generations without any contact from the Negro people. But if Negroes were literally everywhere, how is this possible?
thousands of volumes have been written about the historical and social relations existing between Europeans and the native people of the Americas and between Europeans and Africans but the relations between Native Americans and Africans have been sadly neglected the entire Afro Native American cultural exchange and contact experience is a fascinating and significant subject but one largely obscured by focus upon European activity and European colonial relations with peripheral subject peoples. Africans and Americans must now be studied together without their relations always having to be obscured by the separations established through the work of scholars focusing essentially upon some aspect of European expansion and colonialism. It is especially important to note here that those relationships do not only begin in the Americas. On the contrary, they also take place in Europe and in Africa and perhaps also in the Pacific. Contacts in Europe can be seen as significant because both the African and Native American ancestry there has tended to be absorbed into the general European society and whatever earlier cultural developments have occurred have now become part of the modern European culture. The impact of non-European peoples upon European societies directly within Europe has not as of yet been fully explored and of course there is now a large new group of Native Americans and people of African descent in Europe. Contacts in the Americas have been studied to some extent, but much work remains to be done. Contacts in Africa have been studied very little. The fact of a relatively small but steady presence in Africa from at least the early 1500s onward may well prove to be a vital area for future research since one would expect to find Native American cultural influences in regions such as Angola, Zaire, and Ghana, Cape Verde, and Guinea especially. It is of course interesting to note that some Africans were already exposed to American cultural influences before leaving Africa. Hmm. The cultures brought by Africans to the Americas may already have been influenced, especially by Brazilian Native Americans. The extent of such cultural exchange will obviously have to be worked out in careful research in Angola, Ghana, Guinea, Cape Verde, and other places, as well as in the archives. Long ago, when first working with my own Powhatan people of Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware, I discovered that the meaning of racial terms was a controversial issue. I learned that terms such as mulatto and colored were used or had been used in Virginia in a quite different way from their usage in most books, including modern dictionaries. I also discovered that many questions were not answerable within the context of the latter, such as what do you call a person of mixed American, European, and African ancestry? No one provided any answer because it seems the American mixture with the African was generally subordinated to focus upon or a fascination with the only black-white nexus. The modern dictionary has also stated that a mulatto was the child of a black and a white or someone of mixed black and white ancestry. But where did that leave those who were also part Indian? In any case, I discovered that Native American descendants had been legally defined as mulattoes in Virginia in 1705 without having any African ancestry. 
Thus, I knew that the dictionaries were wrong and that there was a lot that was hidden from view by the way most authors had written about the southern United States, about slavery, and about colored people. I later discovered also that the same thing was true as regards in the Caribbean, Brazil, and much of the rest of the Americas. The unraveling of misconceptions is almost as important as the creation of new conceptions, it would seem. And this is nowhere more true than in the realm of race relations. So before we can seriously reconstruct black African native contacts, one must clear away a lot of mistakes. Mistakes arising out of the very nature of discourse in a racist colonial setting as well as mistakes arising from the assumption that the current meanings assigned to the racial terms have an equal validity for the past. We may think we know what the word Negro means today, but do we know what it meant in 1800 in Virginia? And did it mean the same as colored? Fabricators of the world's classical history books have gone above and beyond every length possible to literally suppress the Negro into historical oblivion. Caucasians and Mongoloids have been pushing fraudulent history for as long as they could read write and walk the Beringia theory however does put the Mongols in America before the Caucasians and although we know they weren't the first to be here this narrative does give us insight into the Canaanite invasion it was written that the sons of Ham, specifically Canaan, broke the oath by infringing on Shem's land. Could these Mongols have been Canaanites? When they got here, were they still Negro or were they something else? These questions and more on the next episode of The Smartest Beast in the Field.